The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Please be seated. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. His his disciples asked him, Rabbi, was it his sin or his parents' sin that caused him to be born blind? Neither, answered Jesus. It was no sin, either of this man or of his parents. Rather, it was to let God's works show forth in him. We must do the deeds of the one who sent me while it is day. The night comes on when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. With that, Jesus spat on the ground, made mud with his saliva, and smeared the man's eyes with the mud. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went off and washed and came back able to see. His neighbors and the people who had been accustomed to see him begging began to ask, Isn't this the fellow who used to sit and beg? Some were claiming it was he. Others maintained it was not, but someone who looked like him. The man himself said, I am the one, all right. How were your eyes open? That man they called Jesus made mud and smeared it on my eyes, telling me to go to Siloam and wash. When I did go and wash, I was able to see. Where is he? They asked. He replied, I have no idea. He hears the darkness of my mind, the day he gave my sight to me. It was not sin that made me blind, it was no sin. blind and now I see. Next, they took the man who had been born blind to the Pharisees. Note that it was on a Sabbath that Jesus made the mud paste and opened his eyes. The Pharisees, in turn, began to inquire how he had recovered his sight. He put mud on my eyes. I washed it off and now I can see. This prompted some of the Pharisees to assert, this man cannot be from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others objected, if a man is a sinner, how can he perform signs like these? They were sharply divided over him. Then they addressed the blind man again. Since it was your eyes he opened, what do you have to say about him? He is a prophet. The religious leaders refused to believe that he had really been born blind and had begun to see, until they summoned the parents of the man who now could see. Is this your son? And if so, do you attest that he was born blind at birth? How do you account for the fact that he can now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and we know he was born blind. But how can but how he now but how he can now see or who opened his eyes we have no idea ask him he is old enough to speak for himself his parents answered in this fashion because they were afraid of the religious leaders who had already agreed among themselves that anyone who acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue that was why his parents said He is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned a man who had been born blind. Give glory to God. First of all, we know this man is a sinner. I would not know whether he's a sinner or not. I know this much. I was blind before. Now I can see. They persisted. Just what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I have told you once, but you would not listen to me. Why do you want to hear it all over again? Do not tell me you want to become his disciples too. 
You are the one who is that man's disciple. We are the disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we have no idea where this man comes from. Well, this is news. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if, that if someone is devout and obeys God's will, God listens. It is unheard of that anyone ever gave sight to a person blind from birth. If this man were not from God, he could never have done such a thing. What? You are steeped in sin from birth, and you are giving us lectures? With that, they threw him out bodily. When Jesus heard of his expulsion, he sought him out and, said, and asked him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? You have seen him, Jesus replied. He is speaking to you now. I do believe, Lord. And the man bowed down to worship him. Then Jesus said, I came into this world to divide it, to make the sightless see and the seeing blind. Some of the Pharisees around him picked this up, saying, You are not counting us in with the blind, are you? To which Jesus replied, If you were blind, there would be no sin in that. But we see, you say, and your sin remains. Ask me not how, but I know who has opened up new worlds to me. This Jesus does what none can do. I once was blind and now I see. I once was blind. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. There are a lot of blind people in the world. Oh, not people who are necessarily physically blind, but people who, for one reason or another, simply don't see the truth, or the reality, right in front of them. I know, speaking from my own experience, there are many reasons that exist why sometimes I don't see the truth, the reality that perhaps God is trying to reveal to me. Sometimes it's because of my own preconceived notions about how things are or my own concerns that I am wrapped up in. Sometimes it's because of expectations or lack of expectations that I have of people. Sometimes it's my own agenda, things that I've got to get to and get done that keep me from seeing what's happening around me. I know there are reasons and places in my life where I am blind. And I'm bold enough to say that that's probably true for every single one of us. Just because we're Catholic, we're Christian, doesn't mean that we see everything. It doesn't mean that we aren't likely to be blind as well. And we need to be aware of that reality, lest we end up like the Pharisees saying, oh, I see, but actually, in reality, remain blind. I cannot tell you what the blindness is in your own life, in your own existence. Uh, you may be completely unaware of it, blind to the fact that you're blind. But I can't think of some reasons why it happens. Every year since the first century, the church has proclaimed this gospel that we have heard today from John. 
And the story really is not about a miracle. It's not about a man physically getting his sight back. Whenever John tells a miracle story, well, he never calls them miracles. He always calls them signs. And the point of the signs are to move people from unbelief to belief. And that's really what the story is about. People moving from the darkness of unbelief to the light of believing in Jesus. Just the healing of the blind man happens to be the, this, the, the vehicle through which it happens. Uh, the story reveals John's love of symbolism, of light, of darkness, of people misunderstanding what's going on. But eventually it's to get us to what Paul says in the first, second reading today, to be children of the light, to move us from disbelief, unbelief, to deeper belief. And to do that, we need to become more aware of the reality of God's action, presence, love in our lives, more aware of the truth that he reveals to us. And there are a limitless number of reasons that that might happen, why we might not perceive that. Um, taking a cue from the Pharisees, I think one of the reasons that sometimes we don't see what God is trying to show us is, um, well, because we become, we become kind of rigid in our systems, if you will. For example, the Pharisees, um, they were right. It was against the law to work on the Sabbath, and Jesus did work on the Sabbath. He broke the law. In one sense, end of the argument, right? Right. But they were so caught up in their system, they were so caught up in the religious laws that it trumped everything else. It trumped uh, the people it was meant to serve. It trumped them and kept them from seeing God working outside of the system, outside of the laws they were trying to keep. And I think sometimes that's like us. We can put God in a box. God is God, but only within these limitations. Are you willing to let God be God in all of God's divine freedom and creativity and unexpectedness and the fact that he's beyond our wisdom, our understanding, our intellect, that he works in ways that seem completely bizarre to us? Are you open to that reality? Sometimes I think we get a little bit of Pharisee going on where folks would say, this is how it's been. This is how it's always been. I know what God's role is in my life and what God does for me. And here's the time in my day that God gets. And outside of that, that's the system I work in. That's how God and I relate, and that works for me. That can leave us blind. That can leave us blind, because God is so beyond any of that. I mean, this week, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we had our parish mission, which actually took off in directions that I didn't expect. It was pretty spectacular. But, I mean, to be real honest with you, and not condemnatory in any way whatsoever, I expected this. There were some members of our community that I heard through the grapevine were grumbling because Pastor Steve was not Catholic. Yes, yes. I mean, they were a little bit blind. God works within the Catholic Church. No, sorry. Well, he does, but he works well beyond that, too. Even Pope Francis said, there is no Catholic God, there, there's God. We happen to approach him in a Catholic way, but there were those who were concerned that we were going to become a Protestant church, like, really, I'm going to do that? No, I don't think so. Absolutely not. Sacraments, far too valuable, far too valuable. But along comes Pastor Steve, and for those of you who were here, he opens up the Our Father for us in a way that touched so many people and moved so many people. And even brought some of those who were like, I'm against this, to go, hmm, maybe not. Congratulations. Blindness falls away. We see God working in ways that we never would have expected. Do you have God in a box somewhere? Somehow? What you expect and don't expect God to do? Watch out. I think another thing that keeps us from uh, seeing clearly, something that keeps us blind, and maybe we even welcome it, is... Fear. We've been talking about fear in our faith-sharing groups this Lent. And fear is one of those things that can really keep us blind, I think. There come moments when we are afraid of seeing the truth, of seeing what God calls us to, of, of seeing what God expects of us, because, quite honestly, 
if we encounter God's reality, God's truth in a new way in our life, it could mean that we're going to have to change. We're going to have to change our expectations, our prejudices, the way we live, the way we spend our time, the way we spend our resources, what we do for entertainment. It's going to change our lives. It could change even the work we do or the people we spend time with. And that's just hard, very hard. And we're tired enough. We don't have the energy to deal with the conflict it might create or the overhauling of our life, even for the sake of God. We don't want to do that. We can be afraid of doing that. And the problem with fear, not only does it keep us blind, but it makes us think that nothing new is possible in our lives. It keeps us small and unexpectant of great things happening. It keeps us from sometimes recognizing how pale and anemic our life can be. It keeps us, fear keeps us from recognizing our own sin. I think one of the reasons why the attendance at confession has dropped over the last several generations is because we've got this whole, I'm okay, you're okay, everything's fine and excusable thing going on in our society, and we apply it to that which God does not find acceptable. But we just don't need God to show us that it's not acceptable, please. Please, let me stay blind to the fact that I'm not everything God wants me to be and blind to the fact that God wants me to try to do better in that. That's just too much work to change my life. And that fear keeps us from becoming the children of the light that Paul says we should be. I'm challenged by a line in the second reading today where Paul says, seek what is pleasing to God. Try to find what is pleasing to God. When was the last time you actively set out to find in your life what is pleasing to God? That's work. That's work, and I'm busy enough. I have no time for that. Fear can keep us small. Or maybe another reason. From the first reading today, when Samuel goes to find a king for Israel, he goes to find someone of lofty stature. And sure enough, it's not the person of lofty stature that God has chosen. Sometimes our stereotypes of others, our expectations or lack of expectations of them, can put them in a place where we dismiss them as something possible that God could move through. We look for people of lofty stature, and goodness knows, this person doesn't belong to the, belong to the right clique, doesn't have the right hobbies, this person's not of the right gender, that one's not of the right economic status, this one's not of the right faith, this one's not of this or that or the other thing, and so we dismiss them. The Gospels are full, I mean embarrassingly full, of people who everyone else dismisses that God moves through, that God speaks to, that God teaches us through, including today, the man born blind, steeped in sin since the moment of his birth, and yet this is the one to reveal the glory of God. And we can so easily look at other people and say, you got nothing for me, I don't like you. You're not good enough looking. Whatever it is. Reasons why we set people aside. You may be able to think of someone right now. And that just might be someone who you're blind to their goodness, to the gifts they have to offer you, to the way that God wants to speak to you. Our stereotypes far too easily put people in a box and keep them from being who they might be in our lives, who God might speak to us through. And of course, the list could go on and on of the things that keep us blind. Just because we're Catholic, just because we're Christian, doesn't mean that we aren't prone to it. One of the dangers is that we think we aren't. We don't realize that there's blindness in our life. So, thank God, once again, the elect and the candidates rise up among us today. Part of their ministry, reminding us and showing us how blindness can be changed. They are folks who have heard something new in their life. They've got a new vision, a vision of Easter, a vision of new life in Christ that is actually changing the way they live in the world, the way they see other people in the world, the way they act in the world, and the way they understand how God is moving and acting in their life. Today we celebrate the sacred, second scrutiny with them, bringing forth all that is of God and casting out all that is not of God. And in that process, they show us 
what it is to be open to God who will drive out our blindness. For the rest of this Lent, the few weeks that are left, we might do well, as scary as it can be, to ask God to show us where we are blind, to drive out that blindness, to heal our sight so that we can live evermore as the people he needs us to be, as children who dwell in the light.